problem. Thanks for asking me. Hopefully they won't be totally bored and falling asleep. So these students come from different counties. Um, most of them. Hi. This is the. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. And we're Go ahead signing and sign in here. Um, So these are students. A challenge we have is the students are in college for the full semester. And so we'll have an onboarding series, an introductory series. But in addition to the lab work, we're requiring them to do certain professional development hours. So this leadership series is one of the things we do. It's like, okay, what if people have been here for a while? He's here. And that door got locked again. This is second week in a row that that door's been locked. And that door's been Hi, Andrew. I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good to see Good you. Thanks for me. coming. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to have you. <laughs> The software system that we have for now. So, Andrew, we've been talking about getting Moy as an ethics school for how long were you guys in, been in Kenya? I think 2003 is the first visit that we went when we were sort of testing the water. So 14 or 15 years. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, the idea. They for sure should be. They were. We just had a group that came back like, oh, we were talking to people that were so excited. Like, yeah. <laughs> but there's got to be the interest over on the other side. Yeah. We're going to make another pitch. What do you think? OK. <laughs> Either that or I've had my day flipped. <laughs> um, welcome you all. Andrew can explain what this means. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so this is a leadership series. Um, so last week, those of you that were here, you heard uh, Sheila Cooper, that one of our representatives. And what we try to do is we try to identify um, people Associate Provost uh, for engagement. Um, and engagement is what we're doing over in Epic. So Dr. Abel oversees um, engagement activities from the university. How many of your teams have been involved in like service learning grants? Okay, some of you are on my teams. We had to ask those and you did not raise your hand. So there's actually more of that. His office is actually where we ask. Uh, we're very honored because from a leadership standpoint, the first time I actually got to work with him was when he had a different portfolio in the program's office, he is working with uh, faculty development and leadership, and he, the Big Ten universities um, actually do a lot of collaborating, so it's not just an athletic uh, group, but what they do is, is with faculty, they do leadership seminars across actually got to see how respected he was across our, our peer institutions and, and the other institutions. So he actually worked on leadership training and development, and then he shifted over in his role in engagement and 
partially the reason that they put him in that position is he's one of the exemplars for engagement uh, at Purdue. He comes out of pharmacy, so it's a little different, but if he was in fall, pharmacy has an uh, internationally renowned program uh, in Kenya uh, with that. So, so he understands what we do with engagement. Uh, leadership is one of his things that he's practiced in the top work. So I'm just going to over to him. I just always okay. dress impeccably. <laughs> I have to dress nicely for you guys. Hi. I hope you get a little bit more enthusiastic before the end of this. I know I'm no Sheila Klinker, but, but I'm going to try really hard. So I, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was actually really surprised when Andrew contacted me because I guess I don't perceive myself on a regular basis as being a speaker at a leadership seminar. But it's been a, a really fun ride, actually. And so. I know I'm supposed to spend a little bit of time talking about my journey, so I will do that, and then we'll have plenty of time for you guys to ask me um, whatever, whatever questions you might have. Um, so from the beginning, um, I'm from Elkhart, Indiana, um, and the, the pictures that are up here, each one of them has meaning for me, so I'll start with the one in the middle of the top row. That's a, that's a tool and die shop for those of you that um, have not seen one, which probably all of you have. And uh, so my parents owned a tool and die shop, um, why, wh uh, at the time I would have never imagined that someday this would actually matter to me in my life, um, but it does now because in the Office of Engagement we do so much interface with manufacturing companies and I tell these people that I'm a pharmacist and they just look at me funny and then they point at the machine and they go, well that's a lathe, yeah, I know how to run that, well that's a punch press, I know how to run that too, that's a die, I know my parents made that. So um, um, what really was <laughs> My first job that I did for free for many years and then started making a whopping dollar an hour for cleaning the machine shop um, actually is very meaningful to me. The, the, uh, growing up in Elkhart, that was the, um, what we would call the trailer or the, the mobile home capital of the world, really. And so it's really odd when you look at somebody when they're older and, and think that my aspirational dream was to live in a trailer, but it actually was because we always had a trailer show every year and they always seemed to have the coolest things when we would go see them on an annual basis. So my sister and I decided that someday, you know, if we really made it into the, into the big league, we would live in a trailer. She actually did live in one for a while. I never did. Um, Elkhart High School is also on the top. Um, and why was that, that mattered to me? Um, we had, we were only one high school when I was in school, and we had our own division for the sophomores. And so moving out of middle school into high school, and being in a building with only other people like ourselves, you know, we thought we were just so cool. And then we went to the other high school with the juniors and seniors and found out that we really weren't. But it was a great, a great experience. Um, Elkhart is the home of Miles Laboratory, which has now been merged into Bayer. That's where Alka-Seltzer and other things have come from. It's also, it also at the time was the band instrument capital of the world. And then the other um, is just a, a, a view of what downtown Elkhart looked like when I was growing up. Um, what did I learn growing up in Elkhart? A couple of important things that, that I still use today. One was um, it's important to dream. And um, probably my most important lesson growing up, my dad just said, I think um, you should find a job where whenever you come home you're clean. Because at, the, at that time working in a machine shop was not nearly as clean as it is now. And so he, he just said basically that's, um, that's my goal for you. The, uh, the reason that pharmacy is, where, is what I pursued was because of an eighth grade social studies teacher who made us do a deep dive into possible careers and pharmacy ended up surfacing for me and from that moment forward I knew that it was what I wanted to do and I'm just lucky enough that when I got here it actually still um, really appealed to me and it worked out. It's been quite a lot of fun. After Purdue, um, I went to Mayo Medical Center, so in pharmacy, much like in medicine, you can do postgraduate training one or two years and, to, and specialize in something. In, in my day, because I realize I'm um, quite a lot older than you guys, we really only had one choice for residency. It was for one year, and so you would go and basically sort of fine-tune the skills that you, had, um, that you had learned. And Mayo was a stretch for me because um, I really wasn't sure that it was the right environment for me. I figured that, I just figured, and so leadership lesson, don't make any assumptions, that because it was Mayo Medical Center that it would be very physician dominated and I wasn't sure that I would actually feel like I was part of something there. 
Um, that was grossly inaccurate and is still grossly inaccurate today. And in fact, if you do any kind of background research on the Mayo Clinic, you'll find that they are very interdisciplinary, highly collaborative. And um, it was an incredibly wonderful place for me to, to uh, live and work. And I learned a lot in a year in Rochester, Minnesota, including why people plug in their cars in the middle of winter because they freeze. Uh, uh, it was a great experience being at, at Mayo. My, uh, my leadership lesson from Mayo was, um, again, also to believe in yourself and not to sell yourself short um, just because you aren't a high-profile physician in a very high-profile place. The next stop took me to Houston, Texas. Um, I'm um, one of those people who pursues opportunities that are um, kind of new and different. And so when I graduated and finished residency, I asked myself the question, you know, what's out there in the job market, and then um, where are my deficiencies? And so there was this job that was sponsored through Alcon Laboratories, which is a pharmaceutical company, and they make ophthalmic drugs. And um, I know we did have a couple of lectures, basic lectures that had something to do with ophthalmic drugs, but I knew nothing about ophthalmic drugs and thought this could be a chance for me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. And uh, so my job took me to Houston, Texas, where I spent my time partially between Baylor University and the University of Texas in their um, eye center, in their eye institute. So the guy up here with the white hair on um, my right is um, Richard Ruiz, who was the chief physician for the clinic at the University of Texas. And um, so what I learned in Texas was um, a lot, <laughs> first of all. Uh, Sometimes it's actually good to be prepared for a job that you go into. I, uh, I did a lot of studying. Um, I was able to have a really progressive practice there. I was able to manage my own group of patients. I did their eye exams. I prescribed their drug therapy. Um, and at the time, it was really progressive. And really, <laughs> that's where pharmacy is going now. And this was back in the late 70s. So I, I don't know that I fully appreciated the opportunities that I had at that particular point in time. Another uh, leadership. Uh, I guess pearl, an important thing for me was um, to uh, honor the fact that other people see possibility in you. Um, Dr. Ruiz in particular, unbeknownst to me, recommended to the FDA that I be appointed to an FDA advisory panel on ophthalmic drugs. I had no idea that that had happened and I actually was chosen to serve on that panel and was um, able to orient to the FDA process. And then right when I was supposed to start my four-year term, we had um, what I would call governmental reorganization, and so that committee was absorbed into another committee, and my opportunity with the FDA was, um, was gone. So I had to, I was just intrigued by this enough to try to figure out another route to get in there, and so I decided <laughs> that even though I was practicing in ophthalmology, that I really should be on the psychopharmacologic drugs advisory committee, and I, and I sold my way into that literally by convincing the selection committee that, you know, I'm a pharmacist, and so I have to care for all different types of patients, and I have to care about all different types of patients. And I actually did have good clinical experience, a couple of rotations in psychiatry, and for whatever reason, <laughs> they believed me. And that, um, that led me to eight years uh, with the FDA, eight years where I made a lot of um, great friends. And I, my leadership lesson there, and this was a really important one that I hope you guys maybe can take away something from, is um, you for sure don't have to be the expert in everything. You know, um, um, Bill asked me, was I going to explain this? The, uh, no. Um, but, uh, you know, there were, there were very high-profile physicians on my groups. There were the statisticians there. I didn't have to be that person. But I was the only person on that committee that truly looked at things from the perspective of a patient and what it would be like for certain patients to actually experience these disorders and um, look very carefully at the trials and some of the side effects that were associated with these drugs and really try to help people understand um, both the, uh, it's like the real world reason why you would want to approve a drug, but also the real world reason why you may not wish to approve a drug. So it was a really, um, a really outstanding experience for me and I loved, I loved Houston. Unfortunately, um, Alcon, one of their founders was a pharmacist and he always wanted people like me to work for his company and work with, um, physicians that were completing their residency and in practice, but he um, chose to retire and we were looked at as um, expensive fringe benefits and so our program was on the list to be deleted and so I needed to find another opportunity which led me home to Indiana, to Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis and I went there um, and spent 16 years um, 
it's, it's kind of, this is sort of funny. I was assistant director of pharmacy for clinical and educational services when I went to IU, and I was assistant director of pharmacy for clinical and educational services when I left IU. And my father-in-law um, still tells me today, you know, I always wondered if you were ever going to make anything of yourself, because for him, um, you know, my title didn't change, um, nothing was different. I did remind him that that his daughter and my grandchildren, his, my children, his grandchildren aren't hungry, so I'm probably doing okay. But um, the job at IU offered a ton of opportunity for me because we were growing um, and I was um, learning what it was like to be a clinical practitioner in an environment that was a little bit less friendly to pharmacists than Mayo had been. So a couple of um, kind of interesting lessons. Uh, the first one was be bold. Um, and that's not innate for me. Um, but I, I needed to, to develop pharmacy services for a general surgery team. And I called the general surgeon that was responsible for that team. And I said, hey, you know, Steve Abel from Pharmacy, I'm supposed to be with your team. And he said, yeah, we don't need you or anybody like you on our team. So thanks for the call. And go find somebody that will care, basically. And so, um, so after that, really encouraging conversation, I called his chief resident, which is the one step down, and said, you know, hey, I just talked to Doctor, and he told me that I should meet you guys tomorrow because I'm going to be on your team, and um, so I need you to tell me where to go, and uh, and uh, I want to start working with your team. So I went the next morning, and um, fortunately <laughs> got through several weeks before I actually had to run into the primary surgeon again that I, that had told me no, and um, and when I did see him in person, I said, okay, I know you know that I'm part of your team, but I also know you know that the care is better because I'm there. So can we just keep this thing going, <laughs> you know? And he, and he was actually very kind and very respectful. And so uh, that began the first of a number of different services that I was able to start at IU. My favorite was nephrology. Uh, that turned out to be a good learning experience because my dad ended up being a dialysis patient. Um, what, I, what I learned, from a leadership perspective, in addition to being bold, was um, try new things. Um, we do a lot of drug dosing. It's called pharmacokinetics, and it's very mathematically based. And math is not my strength, um, but I do know how to do pharmacokinetics. And in and in the world of kidney disease, you have to do it every day because all these patients are at different, um, you know, kidney functions, and so you really do have to be very um, on top of this and individualize the therapy really, really carefully. And um, I, you know, I just thought, oh, I don't know if I'm prepared to do this, but I, I struck up a really great partnership with a couple of nephrologists, and um, we ended up doing some really great things and actually publishing a couple of, of articles that led to um, improvements in the way that routine drug therapy is managed for patients that have kidney disease. So um, don't sell yourself short. You know, believe, believe in yourself that you actually can um, make a difference was an important lesson for me. And then Purdue, so in 1996, uh, there was an opportunity, really in 1995, uh, to become a department head at Purdue. I had run parallel to the academic side. I had worked with faculty at IU. Um, at Purdue, if you are external to the university, you can actually be promoted through the ranks as an affiliate faculty member, so I did that um, in my job. So I actually was an affiliate professor of pharmacy practice here. And they told us if we ever worked here that that would, you know, count in the real system. So when the job became available, I was encouraged by a lot of people to apply. And so I thought, well, you know, worst case scenario, I'll be the test to find out if that really counts and if I really am a professor. Um, so I applied, and we went through the search process, and um, at the end of it, there were three finalists, and um, two of them were rejected, and then there, and then there was me. Um, and nobody talked to me. I just knew that I wasn't rejected. And then they started the search again. So I kind of understood that while I wasn't rejected, I for sure wasn't accepted either. Um, and so they finished the search the second time, and they found their guy, and uh, they offered the job to him, and his wife didn't want to move here. So <laughs> I get a call. I, I have been teaching at, at Purdue for you know decades, literally, even before I worked here. And so I got a call from the dean, 
And he said, can you meet with me when you're up here for class? And I said, yeah, for whatever reason, something said, maybe you should dress up. So I wore a suit, and <laughs> I walked into his office. I had absolutely no idea what he was going to talk to me about, although this was in the back of my head. And so he started talking to me, and I said, are we talking about the department head job? And he said, yeah. And I said, oh, are you, are you offering me <laughs> the department head job? And he said, yeah. And I said, OK, well, first of all, it's really a good thing I dressed up. <laughs> and second of all, you know, what do we do next? So you know, what I learned from that was um, don't get down on yourself um, because you're not the first choice. Because you know what? In the end, I got that job. Um, so it just happened the way that it needed to happen. Um, and I, and I, uh, I knew I was a good candidate. I don't know if I was the best candidate, but I was the candidate who ultimately got the job. So coming here as a department head was very difficult for me. I thought I was ready to lead something. I was ready to lead something, but I sure don't think I was ready to lead an academic department. So I had a, a really steep learning curve. And I served in that capacity for 16 years, and I joke. Um, that it took me about 10 years to actually learn how to do the job, which it didn't take quite that long. But there, it was hard. You know, there, there, was, there was a lot for me um, to learn. Um, I'm going to save a piece of the Purdue story for later, because I have a couple of highlights from my life that I'll, that I'll share about. But there's more to it. Um, as Bill mentioned, I moved into faculty affairs and then ultimately into the Office of Engagement. And this has been a fun ride that I'll tell you a little bit more about. I will say, when you have the opportunity to work at a place that you truly love, I love Purdue University. I am so appreciative of the learning opportunity that I had here. And honestly, it's gone on for a lot of years, because I came to this campus in 1971, and I'm still learning in 2019. So it's been a, it's been a great thing. Um, so strengths finders, this is me. Um, responsibility, arranger, learner, positivity, and relator. Uh, this, this is really me. Um, I wanted to have Wu, for those of you that know StrengthsFinders, because I always think if you have Wu, you're like the coolest person ever. So I did StrengthsFinders, and these were my strengths. And then I did StrengthsFinders one more time to see if I could get Wu, and I got those <laughs> again. So I guess that's me. Um, but I will say that uh, I think those words characterize me pretty well. I am for sure a lifelong learner. I am all about positivity, because um, not everything about my existence has been positive. And, um, I truly love to interact with other people. Um, and it's so great in this job, because I get to meet people like you guys that, um, that just aren't my typical pharmacy student that I run into without being dis I'm not being disrespectful to them at all. But it's so much fun to learn about the cool stuff that you guys all do and really actually be able to appreciate that. So I've, uh, I've loved that along the way. So thoughts from the journey. Um, the first is manage adversity. So when I was young, uh, I actually was a, an abused child, and um, that was a difficult thing for me. Um, anybody that's ever been through anything like that in your life, you tend, at least based on my experience, to compartmentalize it and then just leave it there. And I tried to leave it there, um, but ultimately it caught up with me when I was an adult. And I had to address the fact that this had actually happened to me and actually go through some you know counseling and support which i strongly encourage anybody that's ever had a difficult life experience to do there's a reason why these folks exist in society for us and um finally um after a lot of years just realized this didn't have anything to do with you and um you just need to to realize that um, it also is never going to define you and from that moment forward i became a lot more confident in myself and i really began to believe in myself because i think because I could never resolve the issue, I could never achieve my full potential, but I was finally able to let that go, which was phenomenal. Um, take risks. I am that person. Uh, when I was a department head, if you would ask the folks in my department, like every time an opportunity came, I would say, yeah, we need to really think about this. And they would basically want to put a gag on me and say, please don't talk to anybody. Please don't investigate anything new. Please do not be aware of the world around you, <laughs> because it always creates some change for us. And, and, and that is me. You know, I, um, For whatever reason, I have this kind of entrepreneurial spirit, and, it's, and for me, it's fun. Um, so that goes along with embracing change. Uh, lifelong learning is serious. It is <laughs> really serious. I hope um, that you always look at each new opportunity as the chance to learn something new and to do something different, and that you're never afraid of that. 
Um, because when opportunities come your way, they can bring so much richness that you never would have otherwise predicted if you just sit back and look at it at face value at the time. So do try to think about how something may fit in in the big picture. And I would also tell you, don't be afraid to say no, too. I mean, if it just doesn't seem to make sense, that's OK. And the last message, and this was a really important one for me, is the primary one looking out for me is me. And that was, a, that was kind of a hard lesson for me. And I'll tell you where it came from. When it was time to look for a job, we have this big pharmacy meeting every December. And folks like me, that's where we go to look for work. And I had been there. And it's, um, it's a huge personnel placement service. And you just go through interview after interview after interview. And you know, everybody's so, you're being positive, And everybody else is being positive. And so I had had probably 20 interviews with all different kinds of organizations. And when I walked away, to go home for the holidays, I thought, you know, this is pretty cool because I have opportunity. And so I kind of went home and hung out and was waiting for the landline because we didn't have a cell phone, you know, didn't have email. I was a letter in the mail. I was waiting for something and there wasn't anything. And then I, I started thinking about this and thought, okay, you better get going because as positive as you thought that was for you, there were at the time, about 8,000 other people, many of those were looking for the exact same thing you're looking for. And so if you don't get out there and make sure that people know that you're interested in them and that this is why you're interested in them and that this is why your skills fit with them, um, that can be problematic. So it was, a, it was an important lesson. And thankfully, I learned it before, uh, before it was too late. So leadership pride. Um, it starts with the Purdue Pharmacy. They, they did take a chance on me, you know, not being an academic person. Um, by and large, my experience in the College of Pharmacy was great. Um, I, I learned a lot. I was able to grow a lot. Um, the one thing I will say about that job is um, for about six years of my job as department head, I had an, assist, an associate dean position superimposed on that. Um, don't ever do that. Please don't ever do that. Uh, I worked a lot. And um, it was only after I came into the office of the provost that people actually even said that to me, like, why did you do the associate dean job and the department head job at the same time? And my parents taught me, if you have a job, then do it. So I did it. Uh, and I, <laughs> I realized um, that I was w working way too hard. And I said, you know, it wouldn't have been bad if somebody would have said, why are you doing this? Um, but nobody, nobody really, really did. Um, I'm going to stay on the Purdue theme for a second with the Ghostbuster sign over the farm D. So um, I did have a relationship with a boss uh, in the College of Pharmacy that was difficult for me. And so I was trying to identify what options there would be for me professionally. I, I did interview external at Purdue for a dean's job in another College of Pharmacy. and. Um, I didn't take that job because there was a disconnect between the president and the provost, and I just felt like if I went there, I would be caught in a crossfire. So I decided to, to stay here. And um, so I came back here and talked to our provost, and, and Bill commented on this. Um, there's this fellowship called the Academic Leadership Program through the Big Ten Academic Alliance. And that being able to, they, we choose five individuals from um, each of our respective universities to go through this year-long program. And for me, that was transformational. Um, it let me see that there was a much bigger world beyond pharmacy, and it let me think about where my path might want to go. Um, and one direction was faculty affairs, because I have come to learn that my middle name probably should be mentor, because it doesn't make any difference if it's my children or my students or the faculty members that I work with. That's just me, and that's a big part of the reason why I was put here. And then the other piece that I really liked was engagement. Um, so I was lucky enough to do that fellowship. Um, I was also lucky enough to spend 18 months in the provost's office for a fellowship. But when I had said that I wanted to apply for that, I, uh, I was told in no uncertain terms, well, you're not qualified for a position like that. You're just a PharmD. I don't have a PhD. I have a PharmD. It's a professional doctorate. It's like a veterinary medicine degree. So I do have the title doctor, but I'm not a PhD. And I just kept being told by some folks, you know, you can't, you can't do that. And yet I would talk to people in the provost's office, and they would say, this, this is a perfect thing for you. <laughs> so I have one side saying no and one side saying yes. And I'm, I'm just determined. And uh, on two different occasions, I needed the blessing of 